22. And so our question has been this, how can I be, in, in a similar way as David was, how can I be a person who truly seeks God and is someone who, who has that title to, to be like God? Because see, God chose David because David was close to God. David had that trust. He had that confidence in the Lord. And that's why God said in 1 Samuel 16, I have pointed for myself a king. I have chosen the next king. And that is David. Of course, we saw two weeks ago how they needed a righteous king. The Israelites went against God. They went against God's directive, God's will. They said, we want our own king who will fight our battles. And of course, they, they had Saul who was on the surface everything that everyone would have wanted, but he had no character. There's no quality about him that would make him a faithful person of God. And then, of course, we see David. And we see that he was chosen because of his heart. So then last week we saw David go against Goliath, a, an event, an encounter that most people know, but very few have actually studied, that David was never once concerned. He was never afraid against his encounter. And it's not saying that we cannot be afraid, but what we need to learn is that fear, uh, fear cannot paralyze us and take away our faith. That's what happened with the entire Israelite army. That's what happened with King Saul, who was probably better equipped, better trained, and, and probably the greatest person that could go up against Goliath. He too was shaken in his boots. But David had confidence because he knew that it was not his fight. He knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. Tonight, tonight we get into David's life, and I think very few people really study this, this section of, of David's life. You know, because we like hearing about the young shepherd boy who wrote these psalms. And we like hearing about David and Goliath, the small versus the great, and how he conquered this, this, this great foe. But how many of us know about David's life after that? See, tonight we're going to talk about integrity. And we'll see why here in just a minute. But David, David was one who did everything right up to this point. David was one who served. He was one who who was allowing to submit. He was one who stood up against those who had caused issues. But although David had done everything right, he wasn't always treated the way he should have been. And how do we act as children of God when we do not receive fair treatment, when we receive something that is unfair? Because here what we're going to see in 1 Samuel, really chapter 19, we're going to see David going into exile. And that's why this lesson tonight is, is about integrity in exile. One, because David, despite being in exile, he still had the integrity of a person of God. Whereas Saul's integrity could not be found. It was in exile because he had turned against David. So we have one who, despite what happens to him, he remains that, that good moral character, that individual who trusted in God. Speaking of which, what is integrity? I put a, a brief definition on the screen for you. Uh, I think we might have, let me see, I think this is actually the, the wrong PowerPoint there. Oh, she, she's fixing it right now. Uh, I'll give you the definition. How about that? Uh, David was one with integrity. What is integrity? It is the adherence to moral and ethical principles. That is what integrity means. It means that you are sound in your character. Now, we can have moral ideas, we can have moral understanding, but when we're pushed into a corner, when we have everyone against us, will I remain true to who I am, or will I fall? Will I cave? Will I compromise? And that's something we've been talking about. There we go. That, that, that's the, there's the definition for you. The soundness of moral character. Some of the words that we use for integrity, we might use honesty. Someone who is pure. Someone who is sincere, someone who is decent, someone who is good, someone who is upright, someone who is virtuous. But what I saw when I was studying up on, on integrity, what I saw, one word that, that just stood out above all else. Integrity is having that character which is incorruptible. Incorruptible. That you are not willing to give an inch, no matter how hard you pushed. You're not willing to give in. Like we've talked about this past month, you're not willing to compromise. And that's what the biggest difference between Saul and David is Saul caved in. Saul was willing to do what he thought was right rather than listen to God. Saul was willing to, to flee. He was willing to shake. He was willing to tremble. But David was not. And the difference between the two is one had a saving faith. 
One had that trust in God, and that trust in God allowed David to prevail. We as Christians, we need to have integrity. This world does not have the integrity that it should. And we are called on to be the examples, to shine as lights. But we have to have that integrity. We have to have that character, despite what we face. And if you're here this morning, you heard all about being content, that we as Christians, we have to be satisfied with God. And if we are satisfied with God, we will have that integrity. Well, let's look into the text this morning, this evening, and let's talk about David in exile. Let's just read the first seven verses of 1 Samuel chapter 18, First Samuel chapter 18. Let's back up to verse 58 of chapter 17. And Saul said to him, David, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. As soon as he finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself off the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, David his ten thousands. His tens of thousands. I want us to think about David as a submissive servant. This is where we really see David's integrity shine. A young man... Not 20 years old. We speculated last week that he could have been around 14, 15. He could have been a little bit older. He could have been a little bit younger. We just really don't know. We know he wasn't 20 because he wasn't serving in Saul's army. So he was under the age of 20, yet despite his youth, he was able to take down a veteran who had been fighting since his youth. Despite the fact that he never wore an armor like what King Saul wore, and he had never served in Israel's army, he had never been battle-tested, David was able to take down, he was able to slay Israel's bane. You think about this young man. You think about his overnight success. What we see here is that after Saul has this brief conversation with David, he still uses David. He says, you're not going to your father's house anymore. You're going to work with me full time. And David was so successful. You might have in your translation that he was prosperous. He was so successful that Saul put him over his men of war. Not even 18. David is now a commander. And he is successful wherever he goes. That's important for us to remember because we often talk about what does it mean to be a faithful person of God and what are some of the blessings that we have as faithful children of God. Well, when God is with us, we will always be successful. Now, some people may think, well, does that mean that I'm always going to get great grades on my papers and I'm always going to have a great day at the job and I'm going to get these great raises? No, no, no. Success is far more than trivial earthly things. We're talking about spiritually, that when God is with us, we will spiritually have the success. We will have that victory. And, of course, David's victory, his success is seen in the physical and in the spiritual. But you think about where David is at this point. David, again, he has conquered this great foe. He has people praising his name in the streets. He has honor from the king who said, I want you to serve for me. He's been given this great position over all these men who probably are more experienced than him, who are older than him, yet they're listening to him. He has a good friend. He has a close friend now, Jonathan. He has so many blessings. Why was David so successful? As I mentioned, because the Lord was with him. You notice in verse 14, I mean, I can't imagine a verse that better sums up David's life up to this point than 1 Samuel 18, verse 14. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. We see this with Joseph. Do you remember Joseph when he was in Egypt? God was with him. And, and, And Joseph had some very difficult times. He had some very difficult challenges. But because he trusted in God, God was with him and therefore wherever he went he was successful people noticed him they saw he was someone different and that's exactly how David is see David and the word success are linked together four different times in this chapter and it's all because of God it's all because of what God had done 
for David. Sadly, people don't always handle success well. I mean, you don't have to go too far to see so many childhood stars that after they reach this critical acclaim that they're quickly given into the partying life, that they give into drugs, they give into bad deals that they make. And, and before you know it, they're forgotten and they're, and they're caught up in all these, these bad habits and these bad things. They've blown all their money and, and they're struggling to survive. And I just think, how did David handle this success? If you're, if you're 15 years old, you remember when you were 15? I struggle right now, remember when I was 15, but I remember I probably wasn't up to a lot of good. I think about David, I mean, everything he's gone through from being a shepherd boy to having his name proclaimed in the streets and, and being honored higher than the king of Israel. When did you let that go to your head a little bit? Furthermore, you remember when you were a shepherd boy? Someone came knocking on your door, and he anointed you to be the king. And then the king that you're about to replace, he says, I want you to work for me. And you notice as you're working for him, as you're trying to help him, that his spirit is troubled and that he doesn't have any good character about him. And then when, when you're really challenged, you stand up against this defiant giant and you're able to stand up and prove who the true God is. And now everybody's glorifying you, everybody's honoring you, everybody loves you. Wouldn't you take that as the opportunity to seize the throne? you'd probably think about it because you know it's been promised to you. You know the king is out the door and no one really likes him anymore. But again, this demonstrates David's integrity. He took it all in stride. How do I know that? Well, because we read after his great success in verse 5, Saul sends him out again and again and again, and David never once questions him. He never once tells him no. He continues to serve. David had integrity. And because he had that moral character, he was blessed. If you continue reading, you read in verse 16, all Israel and Judah loved David. They loved him. Sadly, sadly, while David was a man of integrity, Saul was not. And as David's fame grew, so did grow Saul's envy. Jealousy is ugly. That's a matter of fact. Jealousy is ugly. And we see jealousy rear its head in the mind of Saul. Instead of shepherding the people the way Saul should have, Saul began to focus, he began to, to zero in on David. And the person, if you go back to 1 Samuel 16, Saul loved David. He liked the guy. Instead of that, Saul's hatred begins to grow. And he begins to seek to slay, to kill David the way David had slain the, the, the giant. First Saul, in a fit of rage, takes a spear and casts it at David. We read in about verses uh, 8, 9, and 10. In fact, if you notice, when we read in verse 8, Saul was very angry when he heard that David was receiving more honor than him. That word angry, it refers to a burning within. It's something that was building up in his mind and his life. And he was very displeased. This saying displeased, and that refers to having inner turmoil. He couldn't stand the fact that someone was getting more attention than him. Saul eyed David from that day on. And Saul, one day when he was angry and troubled in spirit, he hurled a spear at David, and David evaded him twice. Saul grew more afraid. Saul, later on, he tried to conspire to have David killed, hoping that the Philistines would do the dirty work for him so he wouldn't have to get his own hands in the mud and in the dirt. In fact, that's what Saul always does. If you remember, Saul conspired to have someone fight Goliath for him by promising riches. Now he conspired to have David killed, hoping that the Philistines would do. You can read that in verses 17 through 30. But the plan backfired. The plan backfired. And you read Saul was even more afraid in verse 29. And he, David, became Saul's and I mean, here's the interesting thing about Saul and David. David had given no cause for Saul to fear him, for Saul to be angry with him, for Saul to be displeased with him. David had done nothing wrong. Yet Saul was terrified of him because of envy, because of jealousy. 
And both of those point back to self. Pride, envy, jealousy made an enemy of David. And it twisted Saul's mind and it corrupted his soul. And we read this in James chapter 3, verse 16. What happens if I cannot control myself? If I give in to jealousy and envy? Well, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And there's a lot of vile practices going on in this next chapter. And you're going to see that. And you're going to see how, again, Paul, Saul was so twisted. Why? As we talked about this morning, a lack of contentment leads to covetousness. David was still a submissive servant. Well, let's keep reading. Let's drop down to chapter 19, verses 8 through 10. And there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow, so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he was sitting in his house with a spear in his hand, and David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. We fast forward to chapter 19. We see Saul seeking to take David's life again. You'll find this phrase, David fleeing, or David escaping multiple times over the next several chapters. And I think about David, you know, because we, we talk about God blessing us. We talk about how when God is with us, we find success, and that's true. Notice how everything that made David successful in the eyes of men was soon taken away from him. And no, it wasn't fair, no, it wasn't right, but it happened all the same. Because whenever sin is in the presence of God's people, it's going to cause division. It's going to cause unfairness. It's going to cause us to well, to doubt God if we listen to sin. So here's David, and he's doing his job, and he's doing what, what is right in the eyes of God, and he's trying to calm down Saul. And so what does Saul do? He tries to strike out and kill David. It causes David to flee, and he has to escape. And when David tries to escape, he has to leave behind every blessing he had before. He had to give away his position. As his commander in, in Saul's army, he would never serve for Saul again in this army. David had to give away his relationship with his wife. He had to give away his relationship with his mentor, Samuel. He had to flee the scene. And even his best friend, his closest friend who was like a brother, he had to flee him too. To use David's words in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 3, he said, There is a step between me and death. Death had come for David. And it was knocking on the door. Eventually, you can turn to 1 Samuel chapter 22. Eventually, David is in a cave. What happened? I mean, wasn't, wasn't everything going just fine? Have you ever been in this situation before where you are a faithful person of God and tried every single day to serve him righteously to serve him with, with honesty and trust between you and your God, and you're doing everything right, and then suddenly the whole world falls apart around you. We've talked about this before. Maybe you receive news about your health or the health of a loved one. Maybe you receive that phone call that changes your life. Maybe you lose your job. Maybe you lose your home. Maybe something happens between you and your children. Whatever the case is, do you still go to God in those moments? Do you still trust in Him? It's easy to trust in God when I have all these blessings. When it feels like I lose everything, do I still believe He's the King of Kings? Because here's David in, in this cave. And I can't imagine what he was thinking. Well, I say I can't imagine it, but actually I can know exactly what he was thinking because he wrote several psalms while he was in this cave fleeing from Saul. And here's one of those psalms. Psalm 142. And I encourage you when you go home to read Psalm 142, thinking about this poor teenage kid in this cave all by himself on the run. But in the midst of this psalm, while David is crying out to God and sharing what is on his mind, David says these words in Psalm 142, verse 4, No refuge remains to me, no one cares for my soul. I think about, have I ever been in a desperate situation like David? Because even when I 
faced a difficult time, I've always had a home to go to. I, I, even, even when I lose my job or when I lose something that's precious to me, when I, when I lose that family, I, I always have someone or something to go to. David, he's all by himself in a foreign land. And he says, I have nothing left except, verse 5, I cry out to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge. He said, no one cares for my soul anymore. I think we've all experienced that. But David says, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. It didn't matter how low David had gone. He knew God was with him. I pray that I can have that faith. Because I've not been tested the way that David had been tested. But as we saw this morning, we just saw now with David, blessings in this world, and they're great, and there's nothing wrong with these blessings. They're temporary. And people go out into this world seeking temporary relief. But they don't realize that no matter the amount of, of, of money, no matter the amount of pills, no matter the amount of this, no matter the amount of that, it's only temporary. And even if it, you find soothing and comfort in these things today, they'll be gone tomorrow, and they might mess you up worse than you were before. And what we need to understand is that God is able to heal us like no one and nothing else can. See, the world offers a temporary relief. He offers the permanent solution. And sadly, sadly, often God's blessings actually become crutches for our faith. God might give us something to bless us with it, but Satan can take that same blessing and turn it into a temptation and turn it into a curse. See, there's nothing wrong with enjoying things in this world as long as we're still leaning on God. But the moment that we put something or someone above God, well, then we've lost our integrity. Even in this cave, and he's tired. He has sobbed. He has hurt beyond belief. He feels betrayed. David still says, oh God, you are my refuge. Well, you know what? God didn't leave him. If you read in verse 1 of chapter 22, David departed and escaped to this cave of Abdullam. And when his brother and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to meet him. Everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them. And with them there were about 400 men. David suffered, but he didn't suffer alone. And I love the fact that these, these brothers who didn't think much of David, including the oldest one who actually spoke an evil against David, and his father completely neglected David, they came to Soon other people, become victims under Saul's regime, came to support David. Those who were distressed, those who were hurt, those who were in debt because of Saul's taxation. Those who were bitter in soul, they came and they wept with David and they suffered with David. And God made sure that David wasn't alone. In fact, this could have been the beginning of David's mighty men. And I can't read this passage, just these short verses, and not think of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. When, when Peter tells us to resist Satan, resist that roaring lion, don't give in to him, don't collapse, don't compromise. Resist him firm in your face. It's true. Stand firm in your trust in God. Why? Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world, you are not alone. That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to isolate us. He wants to make us feel like there's no escape, that there's no strength in God. But there's strength in each other. Of course, we have to share with each other and build trust with each other. And that takes more than just a few minutes on Sunday morning. That's me being honest with you. We have to be bound together. Otherwise, Satan will tear us apart when we're alone. We've got to resist him. And thankfully, God was there with David, and he made sure that David was not alone for too long. Let's close tonight with chapter 24. 
Chapter 24, well, David's still on the run. I know we're having to skip quite a bit of history in David's life. I wish we had time to go over every, every verse of every chapter, but we're picking up on some of the highlights of David and some of the, the, the stories, some of the events that really made him a man after God's own heart. Begin in verse 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men of all of Israel and went to seek David and his men in the, the front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave. Now Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of the Lord which, said, which he said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his man, The Lord forbid me that I should do this thing to my Lord. The Lord's anointed to put my hand out against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. This is actually one of two times that David spares Saul's life. But here we are in chapter 24. Saul chooses 3,000 of the elite in the army of Israel, and they go after David. They go after this rumor that they heard. And as they're seeking David, well, Saul, he needs to relieve himself. That's the only way we can put it, as we see in Scripture. So he has to go outside to a cave, outside of the camp into a cave, but he thinks everything's okay. Just so happened. Whenever you see a just so happened situation in Scripture, realize it didn't just happen. So he just so happened going to the same cave where David and his men are, and he's vulnerable. If you ever want to know the integrity of a person, ask him or her what they would do if their enemy is vulnerable. Because that's exactly what we see happening here. We see that Satan begins to whisper through David's men, the Lord has given you this victory. There is your king. There is your enemy. There is the person who wants to kill you. You're innocent, David. Go ahead and strike him. Do whatever you think is right, and we're going to back you up. No one will ever know. So David, hearing what they're saying, they're trying to use Saul's hatred for David to make him kill Saul. David, instead of killing Saul, he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. And here's what's interesting what we see here from David is that a person's lack of integrity does not excuse us compromising our integrity. When someone sins against you, that doesn't make it right for you to sin in return. Even though Saul was seeking to kill David, David in his mind, he had all the power in the situation. He didn't kill Saul. He took off a corner of Saul's robe, and then if you notice, his heart struck him. His, his conscience screamed out to David and said, David, what you did was wrong. And we're thinking, why in the world was it wrong for David to cut off a piece of Saul's robe? Well, there are a couple reasons. First is an act of disrespect. And you think David had no reason to disrespect this king. Well, he did. Because Saul was chosen by God, and therefore he's God's anointed. We would say Messiah. He was anointed by God. He was chosen by God. David said, I, I don't have any right to disrespect this person even if they're not living a godly life. He had no right to humiliate Saul in that way. Second, Saul had been at David's mercy, and any act of aggression was wrong. Third, David was a leader, and his men saw this action, and David knew that they could take this moment as motivation for more rebellious acts. And David said, this is not right. And here's the true act of integrity. We don't have time to read the, the rest of this chapter. But if you notice in verse 8, David arose and he went out to the cave and called for Saul, said, My Lord and my King. David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said, Why do you listen to the words of the men who said, Behold, David seeks you harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you. I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord. For he is the Lord's anointed. Here is where David's integrity is truly tested, and it's shown. Not only did he refrain from killing his enemy, he then went out and risked his life so he could apologize, so he could share what was on his heart. David's relationship with God meant more to him than his own life. 
He convinced, he persuaded his men not to attack. He threw himself on the mercy of Saul. He asked Saul to, to cease pursuing him because he had done nothing wrong. In fact, he calls himself a flea, a dead dog. He said, I haven't done anything wrong. David, David humbled himself before the king. Thankfully, Saul, he had snapped out of his paranoia long enough to spare David. Saul went his way and David went his way. The story of David is not over. But here's some things that we can learn tonight. First, success. Success can be its own trial. That's true. David found success in life and success eventually was taken away from him. Sometimes we can allow success in our lives to cause us to become proud, to cause us to be independent of God, to think that we did these things on our own, but David never lost sight. He never lost perspective that he belonged to God. The second thing is that God alone satisfies. Because when everything is taken away from us, where do we turn? David remained true to God. The third and final thing we learn tonight is that we must resist the temptation of revenge. It is the lesson that Christ left us on this earth when he said, love your enemies. Allow God to seek justice, but in the meantime, love your enemy as you would your neighbor. Even in the cave, David praised God. Here's one more psalm that David wrote. He wrote this psalm while he was in that cave, and he said, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. We as Christians, we may be blessed, but there will come a time when our faith is tested. And when we're tested, I pray that we can have that same incorruptible character that David had, that we can maintain our integrity so that God, God can be glorified. That's what David showed Saul that day, and he would show it again. If you're struggling with anything tonight, understand that God is here for you, that God loves you. If you're seeking to be a person after God's own heart, why not make that decision tonight? If you're not a child of God, be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away, and God will make you new. If you are a child of God and perhaps you've been compromising, you've been more like Saul than you have David, perhaps you're like David now and you've had everything taken away from you, lean on God tonight. Trust in Him. Because He said, as we saw this morning, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. If you need anything at all, come now while we stand and while we sing.